Oh, and you're a law professor, right? Yes. And I'm looking at your bookcases, and you have so many science books, so many neuroscience books. You got these brains here as knickknacks. Right. What, 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 what is this combination? Well, it's a good question. I uh, have always believed that uh, uh, the best thing about law is its ability to reach into someone's brain and incentivize them to behave differently than they would behave in the absence of law. So everything law does at some level is about changing behavior and learning about the brain and learning about biology and how people think and perceive and act is all part of the, the grand mission of figuring out how to make them behave better. Well, is that true historically? I mean, in a way, the, I can see that the law um, is an influence or wants to be an influence on people's behavior. You kind of want to discourage right. murder and right. theft and that kind of thing. But has historically, has the law looked into research into people's brains, or did they just sort of make it up as they went along? Well, I think they, they did, as you say, make it up as they went along. We have a long experience with how people behave. What we don't really have a long experience with is understanding what's going on inside people as they behave. Yeah. Where does the behavior come from? What inspires some people to grow up and be virtuous and others to grow up and, and be less so? How do the environmental circumstances that people find themselves in get processed in ways that increase the probability of one kind of behavior and decrease the probability of another. Whether it's thinking about people trying to um, discourage the incidence of violence in society mm -hmm. or trying to get people to all drive on one side of the road or save enough for their own retirement, everything that's happening when law changes is happening inside somebody's brain. Mm -hmm. Historically, we haven't really thought of it that way because we didn't have the techniques yeah, and right. technologies right to enable us to really take, at some level, a bit of a tour or open a window on inside of the skull. So this is a new way to look right. at the law. It, it, it sounds as if you're saying right. it's a new way to look at the law. Do you think we know things now already right. that ought to, ought to change the way we do justice? Well, the, the, the ought in that sentence is, um, is, a, is, is a complex, uh, mm. complex concept. So, uh, it depends a lot on what our goals are. If our goals are to try to individualize justice the same way we try to individualize medicine, then yes, what we want to do is learn enough neuroscientifically about a person uh, and learn about them genetically, learn about the evolutionary biology of the brain and the social factors that, mm -hmm. that were at work while someone was growing up to really understand how it came to be that someone behaves the way he was accused of behaving. Mm -hmm. um, so in that respect, I think neuroscience offers a, a piece of the puzzle. I don't think, though, that it offers the, the, the magic answer that people are often hoping for, that somehow you'll take a scan of the brain and you realize, aha, this person really was only 10% responsible for mm -hmm. uh, his bad act. But that, you're, you're talking about an, an individual, the personalization, right. individualization of Mm. of justice the way, as you say, we already have it, or we're aiming toward more right. and more in right. medicine. But aren't there, um, the impression I get is that there are already classes of behavior, right. classes of brain problems right. that in, in a way ought to be looked at differently if we're going to have equal justice for right. everybody, fairness, right. if we're right. going to have fairness. Right. So when people get uh, injured in their prefrontal cortex, for yeah. example, this tends to have a, a powerful effect, at least it can, on their inhibition. And so if we expect a reasonable person to be behaving in, inhib in an inhibited way, and they're not, and they have brain injury, uh, that could be a causal connection there that we want to pay attention to. The tricky thing is that we don't know, typically, how many people are walking around in society with a similar sort of injury mm -hmm. who don't go out and kill their wives or right. rob a 7-Eleven yeah. or, yeah. or injure someone. And so we, we have some concern about how to draw that, that causal chain from having a particular injury or condition in the brain, whether it's structural or functional, to, uh, to the capacity of that injury or feature to affect behavior and then to some sort of reasonable inference about the probability mm -hmm. that this condition caused 
that behavior. Of course, the law is constantly in the business when it's in adjudicating someone's guilt or innocence or, or sentence of trying to make sense of a very uncertain world. You can't have the judge say, well, we're not quite sure that this guy is the right one, so go back and do some experiments and come back when you're a little bit more yeah. certain. Yeah. You have to dispense with the fellow in front of you and you can't say we're uncertain in the end. You may have a bias towards saying, and this is the good kind of bias, that if we're sufficiently uncertain, we'll side with innocence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, the extent to which neuroscience is being introduced into the courts right now is suggestive of exactly the phenomenon you're describing, which is that many people believe that we can, uh, through brain scanning and, and other techniques, learn something meaningful mm -hmm. about the degree of this person's culpability. And, and there, I think, we, we are making progress, not in, not in answering the hard question of how culpable is this person, mm -hmm. but of adding to the, the, to the dimension or adding to the weight of other information that we're getting about this person's behavior. So let me give an example. Yeah. We would never do a brain scan and say, wow, notwithstanding the fact that this guy is behaving completely normally, say all his friends and coworkers, the brain scan says he's insane, so I guess he's insane. We'd mm -hmm. never say that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if we had a lot of reason to believe that for a long time he had been claiming he was hearing voices and coworkers say that he's taken a turn for the worse and seems to be behaving in a very aberrational way, if we then also have a brain scan that shows some area of the brain is significantly impeded in its structure, we might say these two things together add up to more than either of them individually and we might feel a little bit more comfortable thinking, say at a sentencing phase, that he's perhaps not insane but also not as culpable as the average person. Do you think there's anything that brain science can tell us now that has to do with guilt or innocence? Because I get the impression most of what is is becoming known about the brain seems to be relevant more to sentencing than to the determination right. of guilt or innocence. Right. I, I think that that's a trend that's likely to continue. That is that um, the, the guilt or innocence phase is likely to be most affected by neuroscience when you have a very extreme condition. For example, there was a fellow, um, not a defendant to my knowledge, but there was a fellow uh, written up in a medical journal a few years back who had tried uh, tragically to commit suicide by crossbow and he survived his uh, suicide attempt but he was left with an arrowhead in the front of his brain which had done a at-home prefrontal lobotomy. Mm -hmm. If that sort of fellow then robs a bank, mm -hmm. we don't know that the robbing of a bank is caused by the arrow in his prefrontal cortex but we might cut him a little bit more slack. I can imagine a number of jurors wanting to do so. I picture, I picture a satirical movie in which the gang sits around saying, okay, fellas, before we go into the bank, right. everybody, <laughs> everybody shoot yourself in the head. That's right. We won't, we'll definitely not go to jail. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so uh, so in, in that kind of context, in extreme cases, say, you know, uh, a massive uh, injury to the brain yeah. that's demonstrable and is demonstrable as having been there before incarceration. So in general, and, do, do I get this right? In general, if you do it and everybody can then and it's clear that you did it, that can be proven. No matter what mental state you were in, you you're guilty? I wouldn't say no matter what mental state you were in. I mean we care a lot about the mental state. If you were adjudicated insane, for example, yeah. then we might say, depending upon the state, we might say uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. Right. For example. And then one winds up in a medical facility. Uh, but those cases are relatively far between. And so let me give you an example yeah, of, a, of, a, yeah. of, a, of a case. Um, Grady Nelson in Florida uh, stabbed his wife uh, 67 times to her relatively quick and tragic demise. He was quickly adjudicated uh, guilty of the murder. And no, to my knowledge, no neuroscientific information was introduced at the guilt phase. Mm -hmm. But now having been adjudicated guilty, the question in Florida was, do we kill him or do we put him in life, uh, put him in prison for life? And as in many states that have the death penalty, the jury, not the judge, makes this critical decision. Mm -hmm. 
uh, evidence was introduced, uh, so-called QEEG evidence, a uh, fancy way of saying uh, we put a lot of electrodes on the brain and we monitor electrical activity and see if it seems normal. Um, uh, and without taking any position of my own on the normality or abnormality of that test, mm -hmm. The evidence was introduced that this was abnormal brain functioning, and this man's life literally held, was hanging in the balance with the jury. And by a very close vote, they decided to give him life in prison. And two jurors, somewhat unusually, came out and spoke with the press afterwards and said words to the same effect. One of them, I remember, said, the brain scan evidence uh, turned my decision around. I was convinced after seeing it that this fellow had some sort of brain problem. Is it possible Basically. that what we know now might eventually force us in the justice system to redefine right. the boundaries of the guilt or innocence phase of a trial? In other words, maybe we're looking right. for the wrong thing and calling right. it by the wrong name. Right. When we say guilty or innocent, right. we're 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 bringing a whole bunch of things into that, it seems right. to me. We're, we're not just, did you do it? Right. Did you know fully what right. you were doing? Did right. you know fully the consequences of what you were doing? Right. Did you have a choice between doing it and not doing right. it? Well, maybe that's too much to ask. Right. Maybe all we should say is, did you do it or didn't you do it? And then worry about what you're going to do with the guy. Right. We, we, I think you're right. We demand a tremendous amount of our uh, jury system. So, for example, jurors often come into court thinking, they just have to identify whether this was the guy. Yeah. But often it turns out, it's quickly established this was the guy, but the question was, okay, juror, tell us what this guy was thinking long ago when he was doing something that you didn't see. Yeah. That's, that's a tremendous burden, but it makes a big difference. In Colorado, for example, the difference between killing someone in a knowing state of mind, knowing being one of those legalistic terms of art, and killing someone in a reckless state of mind can be as much as 48 years in prison. What's the difference? For the you same would, act. Would, would you be drunk and be reckless? Or what, what, what uh, makes you reckless and not reckless? Knowing? Reckless is generally you're, you're aware that there's a risk, but you're just choosing to, to disregard it. Uh, whereas knowing you, uh, you may not intend as your principal purpose to kill this person, but you know if your principal purpose is affected, that you're going to you know, shoot at that bird, that you're going to have to shoot through this person to get to the bird, okay? You know the person is going to be shot, but yeah. it wasn't your principal intent. So knowing is generally deemed to be more heinous and culpable yeah. than reckless behavior, right. although both of those are deemed more culpable than negligent. But so getting... So, but, getting so you're kind of agreeing with me that maybe, maybe we're asking too much uh, of this, I, since all these other states are right. getting to be much more... Um, much more accessible right. by right. by brain science. Well, this is this is actually something that that I and some colleagues are trying to uh, investigate right now. I have the the, um, the honor to be uh, leading a research network on law and neuroscience, and there's just a terrific team of people working on this, trying to answer this question: Is there something in neuroscientific techniques as we know them now that can be used to get a handle, at least in the present tense, mm -hmm. of the difference neurologically in somebody's head when they are uh, engaging in behavior knowingly versus recklessly versus negligently. Um, this is, of course, a tremendously challenging puzzle to, uh, to try to address. And it's by no means certain that we're going to ultimately uh, have a positive answer to that. But it, it is one of these directions that the, the techniques suggest that you might go to try to help the legal system answer questions that are so intractable. I mean, the, the rise of neuroscience in uh, courtrooms right now is being driven by a few things. One is the accessibility of the technology and lawyers trying to, tr to do everything they can on behalf of their clients. One is the known fact that some jurors anyway, as in the Grady Nelson case I was describing, are affected by this testimony. Mm -hmm. Another fact is that judges are increasingly citing this testimony, for better or for worse in all these cases. But all of this leads to, or at least aligns with, a public hope that neuroscience can help us be better at answering these questions. How, how much capacity did this person have to control himself? Mm -hmm. uh, is this person telling the truth? Um, 
uh, was this person in one frame of mind uh, or another? How culpable is this person really? And I don't think, there are those in the neuroscientific community who believe that neuroscience will completely revolutionize the legal system. I don't think it can, and I don't think it should. I don't think it can because it's, it, we're too far down the path that we are right now. It would be like trying to shift to a, a 10 day calendar of the week instead of a seven day mm -hmm. calendar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so at least there's nothing soon that's going to upend the legal system. Mm -hmm. And I probably think it shouldn't uh, if one is thinking about neuroscience as somehow answering a question all by itself. Mm -hmm. But where I think it's useful is if it helps to answer a question combined with lots of other tools that we have at our disposal. Mm -hmm. We have behavioral tools. We have eyewitness tools that are sometimes flawed but sometimes better than nothing. We have investigatory tools. We have uh, cross-examination tools. We have a lot of tools that are all weighed within that folk wisdom that you described earlier, where we have some experience with how people are, both by reflection and by interacting with them, for better or for worse. And so I don't think the neuroscience is going to abstract us out of that part of the human experience. But what I think it can do is add some dimension and some weight to, um, to, uh, to claims that people may make that they uh, have uh, uh, less capacity to control themselves or that they were in one frame of mind or another at the time of an act. So I think in a way, coming back to your question about whether or not this, this might change the way we think about mm -hmm. defendants, I think that it, it continues to individualize. I think it continues to add dimension, whether you think about it as a third dimension or a fourth, uh, I don't know, but, but it, it, it adds context and, and a lot of the the history of the legal system, uh, at least in recent years, has to been, been to add dimension, to say, uh, this guy's a bad guy, he did a bad thing, but his parents beat him mercilessly and locked him in a closet and he didn't actually gain language until he was 10. Um, so contextualizing what it means for this person to have behaved in this way can be part of trying to do uh, justice for uh, individuals. At the, same, uh, at the same time, it could also add to the other side of the equation, and that is help us to understand victim impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody says, you know, you know, he punched me and I've been traumatized. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about mm -hmm. that, right? So we look at somebody, we see if they're sweating, we squint at them sideways, we try to get a sense of whether they're telling the truth. Yeah. But imagine if uh, we had a technique to assess uh, what sort of pain you're actually experiencing neuroscientifically. Mm -hmm. oh, sure that could be relevant yeah. uh, obviously on the civil side as well as potentially I, on the I criminal side. I thought you were going toward uh, some kind of lie detection technique, but I mean is right. that, is, in your opinion, or, or is the present state of lie detection using uh, F, uh, fMRIs, is that, right. is that useful to right. us? Right. So there's clearly a there there in the sense that in a rough cut you can separate a group of people who are being deceptive from a group of people who are not while they're on, the back, on their backs in a laboratory scenario with a big loud machine clanking around them. <laughs> what we can't do at the moment is say which person was lying on which question. Yeah. And that's what we would need to do in the legal system is really individualize it and say your alibi, you know, were you at the 7-Eleven, were you in the store? Uh, what did you intend? I can give you another uh, example that's useful in the lie detection context. Um, a couple years ago, there was a case uh, here in Tennessee um, uh, about a psychiatrist uh, who was accused of Medicare and Medicaid fraud. Mm -hmm. And the government had to prove, among other things, not only that he misbilled, uh, but that he knew he was uh, billing in a way that would defraud the government. Okay, so the state of the mind is relevant here. And so the attorney in the case uh, contacted uh, Dr. Stephen Lakin at Cephos, and they did an experiment designed to elicit an answer to the following question, essentially. Uh, uh, did the defendant intend, about eight years ago, mm -hmm. to defraud the government? Mm -hmm. Now this is really fascinating when you think about it. It's trying to introduce neurological testimony, if you will, uh, from the current state of the brain to describe the prior state of itself, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. Yeah. I don't think I intended this a while ago. But so, um, so in that case, which was the first federal case 
to address the question of whether or not uh, fMRI brain scanning techniques could be used in this case to introduce lie detection or as the defendant referred to it, truth verification evidence. Mm -hmm. um, there were two full-on days of, uh, of hearings. I had the pleasure of attending the hearings and the magistrate judge in the end concluded that this experiment was inadmissible. I think that was exactly the right decision. Mm -hmm. The experiment had a number of methodological flaws, but none of them were necessarily preclusive uh, of using this in the future mm, if, as the technology gets, yeah. gets better. Yeah. So I think we're still a long way away from that. But here's one of the interesting questions, right, that, that brings scientists and lawyers to some loggerheads. Scientists, as you know, like to think about a threshold of, uh, you know, 5 percent, you know, at, at the upper end. And, uh, and we'll typically say, if you can't hit, hit this so-called, you know, uh, P.05 uh, uh, value, that it's non-science. We're just not going to stand behind it. Uh, but what do you do if your next best alternative in the legal system is a jury looking sideways at a defendant who's testifying, trying to figure out if he or some other witness is lying? We know that they're not very good either. So what if you were able to develop a lie detection technique that was not good enough to be peer-reviewed science at 0.05, but was demonstrably better than juries? If you wind up in that zone, I could imagine a very lively debate about whether or not this technique might be better than the next best alternative and where that we you, have. Where so, would you fall in that debate? I would fall in the, I'm, I'm a pragmatist. If you show me an incremental uh, advance over our next best alternative, I think we should take that very seriously. Now, we might want to limit it to some context. Maybe we limit it to civil versus criminal contexts. Um, and, and so there are a number of ways we can cabinet and constrain it. But I think if say jurors, and I'm making up this figure, but let's suppose jurors are at 60% mm -hmm. accuracy in figuring out if a guy is lying about his alibi. But through fMRI, we were able to have 82%. And scientists were upset that it wasn't 95%. I think you'd have a good case for trying to uh, use the best available technique, which is what we're doing right now, and we're only at, on my hypothetical, 60%. And uh, so, in, your, in your hypothetical, would the uh, defendant get the chance to decide if he wanted to take his chances with the jury or the machine? <laughs> That's an excellent question. I can see law review articles uh, being, being <laughs> written mean, about it. I right? mean, if so, somebody imposes the right. slightly better machine right. on him, right. I, I would imagine that would be a really good case for right. a, a retrial. Right. Well, I would imagine that under most jurisdictions, no one could impose this. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so it may play out that um, the defendants uh, get the test and then they don't introduce it. How, how um, is it, how is it, it I guess, it, it's very hard. Isn't it hard to tell if a jury is um, guessing wrong most of the time or, even, or any of the time except maybe right. with DNA? Um, um, uh, right, being back, right. backing it, backing it up on a reality basis. Exactly right. So we know in, with DNA testing that we can find individuals who, as as close to a certainty as we can reasonably get, did not do the thing that they were yeah. convicted of. Yeah. Um, and those are rare cases, of course. And so, uh, so the, the the chances are that um, uh, that we will never be able to reliably say case by case, jury by jury, each one of these juries outside of a DNA context got it completely wrong. But what we can say in, uh, in, in mock juror studies is that we create the greatest uh, approximation of a real trial that we can and we, uh, we, we try to attend to the ways the jurors attend to testimony. So you can test so, it out in a mock situation? In mock situation, and of course this has been done many times with respect to eyewitness testimony. Uh -huh, yeah. And this is, I think, one of the great challenges for the legal system. The Supreme Court has said, well, you can, you can still just full speed ahead use this kind of testimony as we have been on a folk wisdom sort of basis, and yet the psychological evidence is overwhelming yeah. that people are terrible at, this, uh, this, at this eyewitness. Is, this is an example, it would seem to me, of things we now know through right. research on, on the brain matched against what I called folk wisdom uh, of the way we're deciding whether or not somebody was there at the scene at the time 
based on eye, an eyewitness account. It, I, it seems to me that it's been so discredited, at least right. that's the impression I get from right. general reading, right. that a, a justice system that has fairness as its main objective right. would, would, would get rid of it right away. Why, right. why is it still hanging right. in there, right. even at the level, as you say, of the Supreme Court giving it approval? Right. I suppose my answer to that, and, and it might seem a little shocking, but let me explain it, is that justice um, or fairness, as you describe it, is not the main objective. It oh. is one of the main objectives. Okay. Yeah, and as there, I and, said it, I had and, a feeling I was overstepping. Well, what, 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 what's, what, well, why, so, what, why is it only one of the objectives? Right, so the reason for that is, suppose I said we could increase the, um, the effectiveness of our fairness determinations by 100% if we only did this one additional thing, mm. and that is triple the length of every trial. Mm. Society can't sustain that. Suppose we said uh, we could have a policeman in every car as you're driving along. Mm. We could have a judge for every dispute uh, individually, and we would just go as long as it takes to get to the bottom. Mm. Uh, society can't afford that. The, the, the resources necessary to do whatever it takes aren't there. And in fact, the will isn't there in the so, population. So what we want to do is our goal is really to minimize the costs of the trial and the false positives. So we have the best fairness right. money can buy. M money and time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Gonna win. <laughs> so what, what, what rises above fairness as a, as a goal? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say it's above, but I would say it's an intersecting vector of, of concern. You know, they're, uh, they're vectors of what message uh, does this send to the entire population? We worry about deterrence as well as retribution. Um, how, uh, how prejudicial might this evidence be in the eyes of the jury, even if we consider it to be relevant? I mean, mm. a lot of people don't know this, but a, jur a judge can decide to exclude relevant evidence because he or she is worried that the juror will overreact in the right. other direction, right? right? So, so all of this yeah, that, is... That, that's, that's, little angles like that really are not something that I think we know right. generally. Right. But, but how, how, do you, uh, how do you account for the fact that since we know that eyewitness accounts are extremely flawed right. and people may be put away on the basis of them, right. Why do they persist? I mean, is, is it just a question of it would take uh, too much time or money if, yeah. if we didn't use that in the court? Right. Uh, it, it's a hard question to answer with any degree of certainty, but there are a variety of hypotheses we might advance. One uh, of mine, uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one who, who thinks this, is that the legal system operates slowly to incorporate science because it's worried that science has a tendency to change. Mm -hmm. You know, so. There was a time, for example, when rapists were all considered crazy people. Mm -hmm. And so the lawyers got together and they started writing laws based on the views of psychiatrists that all rapists are crazy. Mm -hmm. And then the situation changed and sociologists and feminists and others came and said, wait a second, it's not, it's not that they're crazy, it's that they're disinhibited in the situation and they might be disinhibited by virtue of the way culture uh, objectifies women and these sorts of things. And I raise that only as an example to say, the legal system is used to the science changing, and I think not only does the legal system move slowly, but in this case it actually prefers to move with some deliberate speed, mm -hmm. uh, which many, myself included, will often say is too slow. Yeah. Uh, and others will say, well, it's better than uh, flip you know, flip-flopping and, and just you know, hopping on the next car of the train as it drives by. Now, we've been talking about the defendants a lot here. I'm very interested, and I'm, I'm curious to know what your take is on how I understand the work of Ernst Fair in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. in, in one study, seems to seems to say, as I understand it, that there are pleasure centers, reward centers that light up when we punish people for what we consider a transgression. Right. And my question is. Are we going to be able to learn more about to what extent judges and juries are giving out sentences based on that reward right. rather than more more than on what's the right thing to do right. to put it in a right. rough way? Right. 
That's a fascinating question because it, it, it forces us to focus on whether there can be a right way to do it yeah. that's, that's completely pure of, of emotion, of reaction. Well, uh, and so, it's not even an emotion right. you necessarily feel. No, you right. may not or, even or be aware of it. Right. In fact, right. you're aware of doing the right thing, right. which is may may not right. be when right. you look looked at when you look at all the factors later, right. not in the heat of the moment. Right. Where you're not operating right. impulsively. The impulsive jury right. is a right. whole other right. question now. Right. So you're not in that heat of that impulsive moment. And you say, well, wait a minute. Uh, why? Why was that sentence handed down? Because maybe, maybe just it just made everybody feel a lot better. Right. Right. So, so what, how do you tease that out? Right. Well, it's a it's a good question. I I hope that some of our research will enable us to uncover more about what's going on, so that we can figure out how people are affected by different kinds of testimony. So, for example, we know that that when they're graphic images of the dead body, mm. people react differently to it. And whatever their choice is, as, as you put it, that makes them feel like they're doing the right thing, it's often influenced by something that was true whether they saw this image or not. Yeah. Right? And so that, that, that makes it hard to contextualize. I mean, we, we have a commitment to a legal system in which people are making a decision about what they think is right in light of the evidence, in light of what the prosecutor is telling them the elements are of the crime. Uh, but they're informed by their, their entire experience as human beings, which includes feeling good when the bad guy gets punished, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. Well, that's probably a and, very good, useful thing to have in, in, in a jury. Of, however, right, right. if it takes over right. and, and is the guiding person right. in the brain pulling right. the switches, right. Right. might not be so good. Right, so so could neuroscience help us differentiate between when it's driving and when it's simply informing or illuminating a, a decision? Mm -hmm. um, in, it, perhaps the proper experiment could do that. It'd be hard to do it in a, in a realistic situation yeah. with all the, the myriad facts that are individualized mm -hmm. when a single defendant is on trial for a single, single crime. But could we learn more about you know, the ages at which people are more likely to be affected by mm. this mm. Uh, reward center versus mm. overcoming it or not. Mm. One of the things that Rene Marois and I are trying to investigate is, is um, the difference, if any, that legal training has, say, in the judge uh, to making these sorts of decisions. Are they more emotional or less emotional? Are they more rational or less emotional? Uh, or, excuse me, or less rational? And you know, what, you know, obviously there could be self-selection effects that people go into law because they're yeah. this way or that way compared to the rest of the population. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we want to investigate whether or not the legal system may help you override some of your visceral reactions. We, we certainly have that as, I, I think, sort of a common wisdom that we think that a lot of judges, at least we, we hope that good judges, are not merely led a, about by their, uh, the, the good feelings they get when their reward centers light up. Mm -hmm. But as, as you know, we often are, are seeking rational explanations after the fact yeah. to justify the way we feel. Yeah. And so, um, so, so this is critical. I mean, we've, we've got key issues of justice, people going away for you know, either probation or years and years in jail that hinge on the ability of a person to make the best decision they can in the moment with the decision and the information that they have, knowing that they can't be certain that they're doing the right thing. Yeah. So uh, I think we as, as human organisms come sort of pre-populated with a predisposition to, to feel unfairness, whether it's to ourselves or uh, where we feel it most acutely, <laughs> yes, uh, right. yeah. or to others, particularly if they're friends or relatives of ours, or even third parties, and to, and to, and to uh, witness unfairness and to react to it in a way that, at a minimum, is discomforting uh, inside, and at a maximum, maybe intervention. And we do that outside the courtroom, and I think we undoubtedly do that sometimes in the courtroom, but I think that's, that's an intrinsic part of who we are. I think it will likely be impossible to 
imagine a system in which uh, we can so divorce um, our behavior from these um, emotional parts of mm -hmm. ourselves that are, are just entangled in everything we do. And I don't mean that in a, in, in a bad way. I mean, they, they inform everything. Our intuitions, our, our, you know, our dreams, our hopes, our loves. I won't get too touchy-feely for too long, but, <laughs> but that is part of understanding the science of who we are. I mean, we, we have these, these, uh, these complex personal experiences inside this, you know, this, this part of us that is, is enormously hungry. I mean, it's, it's only about 3% of our, our body mass, but it consumes about 25% of the calories that we ingest. It's up there doing something all the time. It's disproportionately consuming. It's what makes uh, me eat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, okay, so you have, you have uh, on one side, science trying to understand right humanity right. and on the other side the justice system understanding it the best it can right. but having to take action right and you're bringing these two together in in scholarly disciplines right. what does the science side need to be, contribute to the law side and vice versa what how much do they have right. to learn one another's lingo right. and Right. And, and way of thinking. Right. How different right. are the ways of thinking, for instance? That's a, that's a great question. The, they're very different. Um, there are a lot of interdisciplinary fields in law that bridge to a field not too far away. So there's law in sociology, law in poli-sci, even law in economics. That within the social sciences, there's at least a common framework for understanding behavior. But you move over into the life sciences, mm. and suddenly it's a different world. Uh, the vocabulary, of course, is very technical on both sides, law and, and science. Where I've found that it's, it's most treacherous is not when there's a term of art that somebody uses that the other side doesn't understand. It's when there are terms of art that don't look like terms of art, like the word knowingly, mm -hmm. for example, in the law, has lots of literature built around exactly what it means to and the, yet to the law, to the law side right yeah. and then on the science side uh, uh, the, the, the reaction is oh I know what that word means yeah. now the same is true in reverse there are times when the lawyers think they understand what it means to have an impulse to do mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. but it might be defined in a way in that scientific literature that's very very precise and so the one thing that both disciplines have going for them is that they're incredibly precise. Mm -hmm. And so if they can figure out the common language, and we've been working for years now, um, uh, initially under a grant uh, led by Mike Kazaniga, uh, to build bridges from both directions that will meet in the middle and, and, and work in the middle, it can be done, but it, it, takes, it takes time. Uh, fields are, are so specialized. Um, one of the things that I think it's hard for the uh, lawyers to understand is how many different subfields of brain science there are. Mm -hmm. And conversely, I think it's hard for scientists to understand how deeply varied and yet interconnected, uh, as on the science side, the law side is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, scientists often think they understand what a crime is or that they understand what. Um, what it means to be uh, using a reasonable person standard. Again, you know, yeah. uh, treacherously uh, technical, even I, though it looks just take common. That, so. Take that and talk right. about that person, right. a reasonable person. I, right. I mean, uh, without being trained right. in either field, right. I can imagine the tremendous discontinuity right. between right. the use of those right. terms. Right. So I, I don't know if, if scientists have... have explored uh, the reasonable person from the science side, but I do know that they feel they have a handle on it from the law side when it's even more complex than they originally imagined. So what it means to be a reasonable person is fraught with complexity of what does it mean to be a reasonable woman in a situation compared to being a reasonable man in a situation, yeah. or being a reasonable 15-year-old or a reasonable 80-year-old. Yeah. How do people respond differently to these, uh, these circumstances that they, they find themselves in. One of my favorite examples uh, of, of, uh, of discontinuity here is the use of the word normative. Yeah. When scientists use that, they're really thinking about um, averaging data. And when 
Uh, lawyers use that. They're thinking about the source of ought, mm -hmm. the source of mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the you should do this yeah. because. Yeah. And that's, you, you hear these yeah. words bandied about in... The normative in, 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 meaning, in, right. this is the way things ought to be, and you, right. you, you've broken that. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, yeah. so, and so people have to spend some time reprogramming their assumptions of, of, of what they're hearing yeah. to, to, get to, to get together. Um, and uh, and that's I think one of the things that makes it exciting, so but it is hard and it takes a while. That's the lingo. Uh, are there? Do yeah. they have d different ways of approaching the work? Different ways of thinking of of, of coming right. to conclusions? And right. That kind of thing? Right. Well, I I think it's it's fair to say, of course, that that science progresses by hypothesis testing. You you generate an idea and you try to find some. Uh, way that it could be falsified or, or corroborated. You, or at least you have to test right. it out. Right. So, yeah. so it's it's an effort toward accumulating bits and pieces of the truth. Mm. Uh, scientists typically will steer clear of the policy angles. What should we do about this bit of information? Well, mm. I'm I'm just trying to uncover what the information is. Now, I don't mean to suggest that, that, that people are wrong or right to get involved or not involved in policy, but the lawyers on the other side of the coin are typically not as entrenched in the law as it is, as scientists often assume, but are often trained to be thinking about what the law should be. How yeah. should we deal yeah. with this new phenomenon? Yeah. If you're bringing us information that, for example, uh, you can particularize the capacity that a person or a group of people like adolescents has for self-control, well, that's a new piece of information. Should we do anything about mm. it? Now, one of the places that you tend to see tension between these two groups is that the scientists will often say, oh, I see, you're in the business of, of deciding how to change. Well, we've presented some new information. Now change. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes the lawyers say, that's new, that's important, but we've got these other value systems here in place that we're not ready to change yet. Yeah. That's not enough information, or it's, it's not compelling enough, or it's, it bumps up against some other rule that we have. Take, for example, the bright line rule about the age of majority. It's just administratively easier to say, if you're past your 18th birthday, we're going to treat you this way, yeah. and if you're less, yeah. we're going to treat you that way. That may not be fair. Mm -hmm. Suppose neuroscience could bring us information that says, we can age this guy's behavioral development to within plus or minus three months. Okay, now that's a that's a really good right. example right. of of these two disciplines coming together. Right. right. What chances that what chances there of that's happening in uh, in, in now or in the, in the near future? Well, I, I mean, I mean, you you can age somebody if you look at them it, in, you, in, in the machine. Roughly, you can compare right. them to the average anyway. Right. Right. And so you've got a couple things going on there. One is how precisely can you do that? And that's yeah. something that's, that's changing and the, the techniques seem to be increasing that accuracy. Um, at the same time, you still have the causal inference, which is just because this guy had a brain of a particular age, do we know that he's incapable <laughs> yeah. of making this other decision? Right. Maybe he was raised by two economists and he, or two neuroscientists, <laughs> and he's unusually good, says yeah. other evidence, yeah. uh, at making wise choices beyond his years. And by the same token, how many kids with exactly his, his picture, his, the, the picture right. of his brain, don't do what Maybe he did? Maybe worse. Right. Yeah. Well, or, okay, or do right. worse. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, right. the, the fact that he may not be up to uh, normal in terms of what right. the average right. looks like, right. that doesn't necessarily mean right. he's, he's less uh, less guilty or more guilty. Exactly. It's just a piece of information. Yeah. But but suppose that 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 we were able to come uh, and say, okay, we can age this person plus or minus three years. Yeah. Therefore, legal system, when you get somebody who's 14 but has the brain of a 19-year-old, this is purely hypothetical. But if this were uh, were to happen, you should treat this guy as an adult. And if you get a 19-year-old who's got a brain that looks more like a 14-year-old, you should treat him as as a juvenile. For now, the legal system is going to say, thank you very much, mm -hmm. we're not interested, yeah. because there is just too much uh, uh, winnowing effect of our resources 
uh, to try to individualize every single person before the so legal it system. It sounds like once you start a thing like right. that, you would have to give everybody exactly. a, a, an FMRI. Right. right. Or, or, and, a, or and, an MRI. Right. And so the legal system is torn between not just the, 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 the resources concerned, but between this tension where on the one hand, the doing of individual justice mm -hmm. for you is something we try to take very seriously. But we also take very seriously the impact of a decision to do something special for you on everybody else downstream. Yeah. Right. So the legal system is trying to do substantive justice while procedurally trying to have rules that are workable for all. So that we don't just say that rich kids who can get an fMRI, yeah. they get to be treated yeah. one way, and poor kids who can't get an fMRI, we're going to just treat them as adults. Yeah. So it's it, it's a complex intersection. Is is there resistance on the part of the justice system to um, an influx from another way of looking at things? Do, do they do they say wait wait we're doing okay we've been doing okay for hundreds of years we don't. Don't confuse us. Yes, there, there is some resistance that, that would be articulated just, just that way. We're, we're doing all right. It's not great. Don't gunk it up with a lot of technical mumbo-jumbo that we don't yeah. understand. Yeah. I mean, we don't want to buy legal derivatives here. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, so at the same time, uh, operating with that, that sort of sense of history, uh, is also, I think, a, a, a general suspicion of biology. Uh, a lot of people don't have a lot of training in biology, but they do have a lot of training in being them. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are concerned that this could be just another battle of experts where people come in and say, you know, his right half of his brain is missing. No, his left half of his brain is missing. Uh, and, and what are we going to do with all that? Um, so, you know, I think it boils down at some level to the fact that people don't like to be caused. Yes. They like to think that we're all self-movers in our own little universe of free choices, and therefore, if you behave badly, so are you. Um, there's, there's not a, a, a great um, uh, you know, drawing of the soul toward the argument that you weren't in complete control. Yeah. Um, at the same time, that's experiencing increasing tension. Well, also, you make these right. distinctions in the courtroom. What, were he, right. Was he in complete control or right. not? I mean, you're right. assuming complete control is achievable. Possible. Right. Yeah. Right. So right away, you got a right. little uh, discontinuity right. of approach. Right. Right. Well, you have you have inevitably these uh, forced dichotomies in the legal yes. system, yeah. right? So the scientists might say we've got this spectrum just as of color, and you could be at any point along this spectrum. In the courtroom, you're either on the guilt side uh, of uh, the end of the proceedings, or you're on the innocence side. Mm -hmm. uh, and along the way, there are a lot of other choices that are forced. Was he in a purposeful frame of mind when he pulled the trigger, or was he in a negligent frame of mind? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, there's, a, there's an artificiality to all of it that I think anyone who thinks about it for a while will recognize. And yet, again, we're in a situation of what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. Do we just hold people liable on this this scale of relative guilt and say well you're guilty 67 between 0 and 100 mm -hmm. uh, but this guy's uh, guilty at 98 um, now we do we back that spectrum in a little bit in sentencing mm -hmm. but uh, but even that is is more constrained and and uh, and cabined than we often want it to be for reasons that ultimately stem back to wanting to treat everybody fairly Right, so on the one hand, you want the person who was a mule for the drug uh, dealer to be treated differently. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in theory, you want all mules to be treated the same and not be treated differently just by virtue of the fact that they were before one judge or another. Mm -hmm. You know, judges are also humans bringing their own experiences, and those differ. And so one judge might take the exact same facts and be very harsh, while another might be lenient. And so it was out of an effort to try to treat like circumstances in a like way that this move toward sentencing guidelines uh, emerged at the same time that it's easy to come up with examples where treating like people the same way is still lumping together people who are meaningfully different yeah. and yeah. Um, on some other dimension. Right. Right. 
So how is, how is science, brain science, going to help? I mean, it, it sounds like we're doing the best we can right. with the legal system the way it is. Will we do better when, when people have brain science to fling around the courtroom? Right. Well, I hope so. But only if they're flinging around just that part of the brain science that's relevant. How can you and, get them and, to do that? Because everybody wants to bring use it all everything right. to their yeah. own advantage. Yes. That's being human, too. Yes. And, yes. and they're not less human in the courtroom, I don't right. think. Right. So the defense uh, attorneys are going to want to bring in brain right. scans, whether they apply right. or not, right. whether they're well done or not, right. or, or even prove anything. Right. And the other side wants is going to want to keep them out or right. bring in their own brain scans. Right. Is right. this is this much different from bringing in a guy who says I can tell by looking at him if he's lying? I mean, the the the, the, the impulse to bring yeah. anybody in you think can help right. is operating in both circumstances. Right. right. It's not only an impulse; it's an obligation of the well, attorneys yes, on both yes, sides. Yes. But I'm I'm uh, a little bit less worried uh, about that um, than I might be because. Uh, the judges in the federal system, and there are often analogous situations in the 50 states, are um, uh, imbued with both the power and the responsibility to decide what is going to get to the jurors. And so in the case I mentioned earlier about lie detection, the judge had a hearing and heard from both sides and decided, after hearing from both sides, I'm going to make sure that the jury doesn't hear mm -hmm. this information at all. Yeah. So there's a, what's often been called this gatekeeping role. Now, yeah. you could worry that that imposes new burdens on the legal system because now he has to hear, have a hearing about fMRI for lie detection purposes. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Um, but it takes the legal system a while to try to sort out the circumstances in which this might come in from the, which, the ones in which that won't. Often gradually through this process of accretion, we develop some precedents that make it cleaner and easier to make those sorts of decisions and to separate the wheat from the chaff. Coming back to the educational component, you mentioned earlier, we're trying to uh, enable the, the creation of dual disciplined minds that can help the legal system in this process, make it more efficient, make it fair, uh, make it less biased. The problem is there are biases everywhere you look. And if you leave this information out, there's going to be some bias that comes in. Mm. And if you bring it in, there might be some new bias introduced. The question is whether or not you can gradually cabin that bias by understanding more and more about the human animals that the population governs, governs uh, in furtherance of treating them in the, the fair and just way that we aspire to. So it, it's impossible to predict whether neuroscience is going to uh, transform this. I, it's, it's not as uh, targeted as, say, DNA technology, mm -hmm. um, which I think has had some you know, very salutary effects. Um, uh, but that's its power, too, because it, 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 it's reaching a lot broader part of the human experience. You've got neuroscientists devoting their entire energies to understanding what might separate real memories from false memories. You've got people focusing on lie detection. You've got people focusing on the impact of emotion on a memory. So if we know that this kind of emotion is going to ramp up the reliability or ramp down the reliability of a particular memory, and somebody wants to bring that in, that could increase our ability to do justice in a fair way. Um, so I, I think it, it, you know, the, the promise is there, but there are some important limitations that we need to stay focused on. I mean, brain scanning is not mind reading in any meaningful way, you know, and, and computers don't create brain scan images. People create brain scan images. You have to have somebody decide at what uh, statistical threshold is this going to be set? What colors are we going to use? What slice of the brain are we going to display from all the data that we accumulated, the gigabytes and gigabytes of it? It's, it's an inferential process, and we want to recognize that there's a human component to all of that, even while we're trying to bring in something that seems to be more objective, you know, this and, part and of the brain. It sounds like what you're saying is that both sides need to understand what's relevant to the to, to, to justice right. and to science. Right, absolutely. And that's, you know, you're bringing them together. Right. Bring, bring that certainly, relevance certainly to the there time. are many of us trying to. Yeah. So, and th this is coming in whether we like it or not, right? It's, 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 it's already there. There are already lots of cases uh, in which 
uh, lawyers are bringing this kind of evidence in. And given the fact that that horse is already out of the barn, for better or worse, we want to try to figure out how do you engage with that phenomenon that's already you know, at the steps of a courthouse near you. Uh, you can, you can uh, sit back or you can try to you know, mix it up in the middle and, and try to get in there and uh, roll up your shirt sleeves and say, let's see if we can make sense of this. You know, one example of this is the general problem of trying to make individualized decisions in the justice system from data that are really powerful but are the results of group averaged experiments. Right. Right? Right. So we can say in our experiment, the average person uses the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala in this way, mm -hmm. but we're not saying that everyone does, mm -hmm. and we don't know what you do. Right. So to um, compare me to the average doesn't necessarily right. mean I'm abnormal. Right. Or that, or that if, even if I am abnormal, then I therefore make the wrong decisions. Right. right. If, you're, if you're abnormal, how much? Are you abnormal? And in what ways? With mm -hmm. what consequences? Yeah. That's the problem because the legal system is trying to deal typically, at least in criminal cases, with individuals. And science is trying to figure out the, the general rules. How does a brain work? Yeah. Uh, and trying to move from one to the other is hard. We could perhaps say science on the basis of these group averaged studies suggests to us that damage somewhere in this part of the brain tends on average to diminish your capacity to make rational decisions in the following sorts of contexts. Maybe you're great as a stockbroker, but you're terrible at managing your checkbook or something like that. I mean, we, we could perhaps differentiate it. And now we've got you who robbed a bank and has damage to this area. Mm -hmm. Do we take that into account or do we not take that into account? How should the jury weigh that? Should the jury even hear that kind of evidence? Yeah. Depending on the circumstances, you might say, and depending upon how large the stack of articles is and how many research institutions there are standing behind it about that area of the brain, we might say, you know, I think we can draw the reasonable inference that on average, you know, when this happens, it has this kind of effect. But we won't always be able to do that. And even when we do it, we won't really know for sure that we're saying something about the causal mechanism in your brain. We'd be making a guesstimate, but guesstimates are, you know, informed guesstimates are all we make in the legal system. At the moment, it sounds like you're, correct me about this, because from what you just said, I get the impression that science is supplying good fodder for arguments on both sides of the case, and um, it's not deciding much. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just giving somebody a chance to get up and wave a paper and say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. <laughs> I think it's somewhere in between. <laughs> but I take your point, yeah. right? I mean, it, it is not, it, but when you say it's not deciding much, you're saying it's not really answering all by itself it's not a answering question the that questions we want in answered. the courtroom today. Right, yeah. right. It is, it is not doing that, and it may never do that because we want it to be. Uh, accumulated with other evidence that's not necessarily the result of sticking somebody in a machine and seeing how they consume but oxygen. How do you deal with that very thing I was trying to, the picture I was trying right. to paint? Right. That if somebody's the, shaking The science water. is done seriously right. and it's not overblown. Right. Uh, claims aren't made that can't right. be supported by evidence. So this finding that most scientists in that field agree on. It's not even just one right. person with one right. study. It's, it's like an agreed thing. It's sort of a fact, right? right? Now, one side of, of, uh, of the, let's say, the defendant's attorney right. Right. might be able to make use of that. Right. And the other side's going to argue against it and find out all right. kinds of things wrong with right. the protocols of the studies right. and the things like that. Right. And all of a sudden, we're arguing about things that a right. second ago seemed a little more sure-footed. We yes. had ground under our yes. feet. Yes. Now, now what? Now, it, I mean, have we just right. have we just right. introduced something to argue about, or there have is we? No ground. <laughs> there is no <laughs> ground. <laughs> well, there was a little more ground when it was in the science we side. We felt like there was more ground. Yeah. Right. So, and, and I, I well, was these being... guys aren't trying to find out if the study is real or not. They're just trying to get their guy off or get him on. Well. True, but that's a commitment we've made to the way we try to 
put people in jail or not. Yeah. We, we, have, we have incentivized two people to do the best they can with the arguments and the evidence at their disposal to poke holes in the other guy. Yeah. And it's the jurors who are supposed to sit back in a, in a somewhat dispassionate but not completely emotionless way and reign over all of this mm -hmm. in making the final decision. Mm -hmm. um, but jurors are group average data. Right? We know some jurors are paying attention and some aren't. We know some understand and some don't. Some are awake. Right, some are awake. I mean, we, we, are, we average things out in an effort to try to get it mostly right most of the time. And so, uh, so it's, it, it, I mean, I, I don't want to suggest that the, that the science is completely up for grabs. I mean, you know, fMRI is a very accepted technique. Might it be supplanted by something else sometime later? Sure, but that's not the question. The question is whether or not the technique as it was applied in this particular situation mm -hmm. tells us something relevant about this guy. Yeah. Now relevance is a big umbrella term. So it doesn't need to be a brain scan of this guy to be relevant. It could be here are the 27,000 studies that show if you don't have a right hemisphere of your brain, there are certain things you can't do well. <laughs> we could draw a logical inference, right? I mean, all of this is about logic. That's where science and law come together, ah. right? So science is about a logical way of trying to uncover the truth. Law is about designing a legal system that's a logical way, the, the, the best we can do in, in a shifting environment of very clever people uh, who, who change every time you come up with a, a change to the legal system. But it's a way to try to develop some logically coherent way of dealing with the chaos of humanity in two ways. One, to try to channel it so that commerce and life can go on. So you drive on this side of the road, not the side of the road you feel like. And also to channel it in saying some kinds of behavior are appropriate and some kinds are inappropriate. Now all of you multiple millions absorb that information and recognize that if you behave inappropriately, we're going to treat you in certain kinds of ways if you get caught. So, so the, the two systems where the lawyers and scientists get together is really about trying to deal with a system that is fundamentally grounded on some sort of logical approach to doing something. It's just that they're doing different things. The scientists are trying to uncover truth and knowledge about the world, and the lawyers are trying to deal with the complexity of human behavior. And people differ, all yeah. of us, yeah. right? So, so there's the search for universal truths, and there's the search for dealing with the fact that everybody's different. And those two things are, are trying to come together in a way that can be relevant to the, the legal bridge, system. But the bridge that you pointed out right. is, is, a, is an interesting one and, and, and gives, uh, I think, a little hope to, that they're both working to, to, toward a logical resolution of these, these uh, right. searches, these mysteries right. they're trying to unlock. Right. So both of them recognizing the logical foundation of the right. other might be able to get together right. on that. Right. Well, that's certainly our hope. And we've had the, the good fortune to have the uh, MacArthur Foundation give us some funding to, to do precisely that, to see what the, the synergies are uh, between these two disciplines and try to build bridges that really have never been built before. So it's, on the one hand, it's an exciting time. And I'd like to tell you where we are going to be in 10 years. On the other hand, it's, it's, uh, it's a real challenge trying to figure out how to develop the techniques, how to develop the wisdom, how to teach the system, how to do the experiments that will move us forward rather than sideways or backwards. You're, you're, you're training people, so you must be confident that, that it's possible. I am, uh, must I be confident that it's possible? I, I am confident it's possible. I would imagine I, you are. I am, I, 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 uh, I, I would say that um, there is a way in which uh, to be an educator, to be involved in the enterprise, you have to have commitment to the idea that things can get better. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it's really hard to get up in the morning. <laughs> so I'd like to think that we're providing information that in the end will net positive. Yeah. But you can never really know that. I mean, that's, that's true of all science. I mean, you, you develop electricity to bring light, and then you're, you know, you're neighbor gets electrocuted. Yeah. Um, so it, it, there, there are two sides to these swords and, and figuring out how to wield it in a way that's responsible and logical and helpful and doesn't cut too many 
hands off uh, in the process is, is, a, is a challenging thing, but I, I think it's, it's one of the things that, that universities and, uh, and, and researchers and, and legal thinkers and others are, are all on the same page about trying to, trying to do that. They may differ a little bit about whether or not this technique or that technique should come in and whether or not it should be given this weight or that weight. But I think the, the force of momentum here is clearly we're uncovering truths about the brain. We just don't know yet where all of those truths are going to lead.